Good evening, everybody. So today we would be discussing how to prevent OPSI in a patient with asplenia or hyposplenism. So what exactly is this OPSI? OPSI is overwhelming post splenectomy infections. We are discussing this today because the mortality can be as high as 30 to 70 percent and it is estimated that less than 10 percent of patients with asplenia really receive the prophylactic or preventive treatment that they are recommended to receive. So what we discussed today would include what is the immunization that we should be giving these ch uh, children to prevent infection in them, which in immunization and when to administer it. Do they require an antibiotic prophylaxis or which subset of patients require antibiotic prophylaxis? If yes, what is the antibiotic we should be giving, when we should be giving? And what exactly we should do when a child with asplenia presents to you with a fever episode. It may be a child, an adolescent or adult. What is the empiric treatment that should be offered? So with that, the first and foremost question is why is spleen so important? Spleen is so important because as we all know, it is the largest lymphoid organ and it is the site of IgM protection. That means the earliest clearance of bacteria from the systemic circulation happens with the help of IgM. And it is also the place where you have memory B cells. Remember, you have the white pulp and the red pulp. The white pulp, you have a lot of lymphocytes there. And another important function of spleen is it helps in the phagocytosis of encapsulated organisms. Encapsulated organisms, we should know, they are having polysaccharide capsules. And polysaccharide capsules are not recognized by T lymphocytes. And polysaccharide capsules are usually negatively charged and are repelled by the phagocytes. So what our body does is it synthesizes opsonizing antibodies. These would coat the encapsulated organisms. And once this protein is coated, it would be recognized by the macrophages, by the lymphocytes, and phagocytosis would happen. And it is also important to remember that spleen is the site of clearance of damaged RBCs. So infections which are intracellular, for example, malaria, so if a child without a spleen develops severe malaria, develops malaria, it can become severe because clearance of the damaged RBCs do not happen in the spleen. So what is the risk factor for developing an overwhelming sepsis? If your child is less than two years or even an older child, adolescent or adult, first two years after splenectomy, you have a higher risk of getting an opsy. And when a spleen is removed for a hematological purpose, like say in a non Hodgkin's lymphoma, in a thalassemia, sickle cell disease, those conditions, the chance of having an opsy is more compared to when you have a traumatic splenectomy. So how do uh, patients get deprived of their spleen? As we already said, it may be a trauma. Anyone with a splenic hypoperfusion of less than 50% is considered to be having hyposplenism. May rarely you can have congenital absence of spleen, but isolated absence of spleen is rare. But you can have cyanotic congenital heart disease, heterotaxy syndromes, which may be associated with hyposplenism. And there are diseases where we medically splenectomy is indicated. For example, a bad case of ITP, where all your medical management has failed, then you may be he may require a splenectomy or staging of malignancies or some malignant infiltrates, splenectomy is needed. And sickle cell disease, almost 90 to 100 percent of patients with sickle cell disease have hyposplenism. Why is it so? Because they often go for autosplenectomy. That is because of the splenic infarcts, because of entrapment of large amount of RBCs in the spleen. Another subset of patients we forget about is the patients with functional hyposplenism. These would include patients with chronic graft versus host disease, patients with HIV. Remember, celiac disease, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, etc., these inflammatory bubble disease, almost 35 to 70 percent of patients have hyposplenism. Part of it is because of they lose a lot of lymphocytes through the GI mucosa, through the GI tract, leading on to splenic atrophy. And also, there may be immunological block of the reticuloendothelial system. The cause of hyposplenism in SLE, APLA, rheumatoid arthritis are also considered because of the immunological block. But in SLE, it's only around 7 to 10 percent would be having hyposplenism. Similarly, hep hepatic diseases, especially alcoholic hepatitis, almost you may have 35 to 70 percent of patients with chronic alcoholic disease 
um, alcoholic liver disease having hypospenism. Biliary cirrhosis, chronic active hepatitis also have hypospenism because of alteration in the hepatic microcirculation. So these patients with these systemic diseases also, we should think of hypospenism, look for features of hypospenism, and if present, appropriate prophylactic treatment should be offered. So which are the organisms that cause infection? As already described, it's mainly it is the encapsulated organisms. They can be remembered by the mnemonic shins. That is streptococcal pneumonia, H. influenza, Neisseria meningitis, and do not forget Salmonella. Similarly, intracellular pathogens like Plasmodia, Babesia, Bartonella are also associated with severe sepsis. And we should not forget about animal bites. Dog bite, cat bite are associated with severe sepsis in patients with asplenia due to capnocytophage. So that is also an important thing that we have to remember. So we understood that it's mainly the encapsulated organism and thankfully we have um, immunization against them. So when should you vaccinate them? If you're planning for an elective splenectomy, these children should be vaccinated two weeks before planned splenectomy. If it is a case of traumatic splenectomy where you didn't have time to plan your immunization, you can start the vaccination either at discharge or two weeks after discharge because uh, it has some, some studies have shown that vaccine response within two weeks of surgery is usually slightly suboptimal, but there are many international bodies which do recommend um, initiation of vaccination at the time of discharge for patients for whom a surgical splenectomy was done. Now, what are the vaccines which are specifically indicated? It would be pneumococcal, meningococcal, hip and typhoid and also influenza vaccine. Influenza vaccine is recommended because often post-influenza, you do get secondary infection, especially with streptococcal pneumonia. So it is important to give the influenza vaccine yearly also. Now, if it is an adolescent, adult, or a child more than five years of age, uh, first day itself, you have to plan to give pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, meningococcal conjugate vaccine, hip, a single dose, and typhoid conjugate vaccine along with influenza vaccine. So we are expected to give five vaccines for a patient with asplenia. And after that, we can ask the patient to review eight weeks later, that is after two months, we are expected to give a dose of pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine, that is PPV23. Along with that, a second dose of meningococcal conjugate vaccine has to be given. And if it is a child less than nine years of age, he requires a second dose of influenza vaccine also. Older children, adolescents and adults do not require second dose of influenza. They just require a single dose of influenza vaccine. So now, is this enough or do, we, do they need boosters? Yes, they need booster. Pneumococcal polysaccharide maxim, that is PPV23, has to be given five years later. But remember, for a person, you can give maximum two to three doses in a lifetime. It is preferable to give the last dose after 65 years of age because um, chance of having pneumococcal infection in that subset of patient is also very high. Too much of PPV23 would cause hyporesponsiveness. That is why only maximum two or three doses are recommended. Meningococcal conjugate vaccine, we need to give booster every five years. And as already said, yearly influenza also needs to be given. Another important thing that you have to remember that pneumococcal conjugate vaccine and a meningococcal conjugate vaccine, which is conjugated to diphtheria toxoid, should not be given on the same day. That means meningococcal conjugate vaccine, at present, we have two brands are there. One is conjugated to CRM, that is the MenBio, and one is conjugated to diphtheria toxoid. So if when the meningococcal vaccine conjugated to diphtheria toxoid is used along with PCV, many of the serotypes in the PCV are also conjugated to diphtheria toxoid. So there will be immune interference. So that is why, and because PCV immunogenicity will come down if you combine these two together. So if you have a patient with asplenia or hypospensum and you're planning to vaccinate the patient with PCV and meningococcal conjugate vaccine, if the meningococcal conjugate vaccine conjugated to CRM, that is MenVio is available, it would be preferable to give that on day zero. Otherwise, you will have to have an interval of four weeks between the PCV and Menactra. Now, what is your vaccine recommendation if the child was between two to five years of age? 
Here we have to remember that two doses of PCV should be given eight weeks apart. So for more than five years, if a single dose, here you have to give two doses. And also the meningococcal conjugate vaccine booster dose has to be given after three years, not five years. You have to give the first booster after three years. Subsequent boosters can be given after five years of age. Influenza also, these children would require a second dose after one month. All other vaccines is just like the older age group. So what will you do if you have a child less than two years of age? If you have a child less than two years of age, he should re uh, receive all the routine vaccination age appropriately. That is your pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, your hip and other vaccines. And typhoid may be offered at nine months of age. Regarding meningococcal conjugate vaccine, in fact, in India, it is made, um, uh, the license is there for both the vaccines, only for children about two years of age. Whereas CDC, as well as the UK guidelines, recommend MENVIU, that is meningococcal conjugate vaccine, which is conjugated to CRM from two months of age, and MENACTRA, that is conjugated to diphtheria toxoid, from nine months of age. So uh, that is the recommendation for children less than two years of age. Remember, all the routine vaccinations should be given. They, are, they don't have any contraindication for any routine vaccination, live or killed. Every vaccine should be given for a patient with uh, splenectomy unless he's otherwise immunosuppressed. He is not otherwise immunosuppressed. And remember, there is one more meningococcal vaccine. The quadrivalent meningococcal vaccine that we discussed is ACYW. It does not have meningococcal B serotype, and that is also an important serotype. So currently, this vaccine is uh, not available in India, but in the um, uh, West, it is definitely available. So if you're working at a place where this vaccine is available, then patients with splenectomy should also be offered a meningococcal B vaccine. So here, two doses have to be given initially, eight weeks apart, followed by a third dose one year later. And if the patient is more than 10 years of age, a booster needs to be given every three years. So that is regarding meningococcal B vaccine. We already said patients should be up to date for routine vaccination, especially typhoid, varicella, and MMR should be taken into account. Now, is vaccination enough to prevent severe sepsis in patients? No, because even pneumococci, we know there are more than uh, close to 100 serotypes. Your vaccines have 10 serotypes or 13 serotypes or maybe 15 in the coming years, but there are many other serotypes which can cause infection. So for the very high risk patients, that is children less than five years, it is preferable to give penicillin prophylaxis to them. In fact, adults with malignant hematological disease also are recommended to receive prophylaxis for two years post splenectomy and patients who are otherwise immunocompromised or patients who have had a history of severe sepsis before and have asplenia associated with it, they should also be offered penicillin prophylaxis. So different world bodies uh, say differently about penicillin prophylaxis. There are organizations which want every patient without a spleen to receive uh, penicillin prophylaxis. But the fact is nowadays we are reluctant to use too much of antibiotics and because whether penicillin would be effective, whether it would lead to emergence of resistance, all that are important considerations. So these subgroup of patients should be offered penicillin prophylaxis. So which are the drugs that you're going to give? You can give oral penicillin B potassium, age appropriate dose, or um, sometimes even now penicillin B potassium is not available. Then you can give amoxicillin 10 milligram per kilogram. Uh, BD may be given. Now, if the patient is allergic to penicillin, then the options are he can receive cephalexin or he can receive azithromycin. So that was regarding antibiotic prophylaxis. Now, what will you do if a patient without a spleen, that is a splenic patient, comes to you with a fever? That means he's high risk of having a severe infection. So first of all, at discharge, we have to counsel all the parents or caretakers that whenever the patient develops a fever and rigor, do bring them as early as possible to the emergency because they require anti proper investigation, evaluation, and early initiation of antibiotic. If for any reason, say the patient is traveling or in a remote place, the time for them to reach the hospital would be longer, then an initial dose of antibiotic can be taken at home. 
if it is taking more than two hours. They can take and come to the hospital. Also remember, patients, uh, these patients should be offered prophylaxis for sinus surgery as well as for airway procedures. So which are the antibiotics that you can use once a patient with asplenia develops fever? The options are you can use amoxicillin clavulonic acid combination, ceftinib, or if it is an older child or adolescent or adult, you know, liver floxacin may be used. Then for pre-procedural prophylaxis, it is usually amoxicillin 50 mg per kg one hour before the procedure. So, and what about animal bite? We already said that animal bite can cause severe sepsis due to capnocytophagia. So these patients should be offered prophylaxis, prophylactic treatment with amoxicillin clavulonic acid in the earlier prescribed dose for five days. So the main key points were, it is important to educate the patient and the family regarding the risk of severe sepsis, the importance of coming to hospital early, and also prescribe the uh, uh, routine immunization as well as the add-on immunization which is specifically recommended for these patients. It is important to give empirical antibiotics for high-risk patients and to give the appropriate antibiotic for patients once they develop fever. And also do not, for, and animal bites also, we need to remember to treat them with antibiotics and not forget about malarial prophylaxis for travelers to endemic countries. So there are certain states where malaria is more common. And if you, uh, and if the patient is a resident where malaria is not that common, when they're visiting to those places, malarial prophylaxis should be off. For further reading on immunization, you can refer to my book, the link to which is given in the description box. Thank you.